Welcome back to Combat Mission Fortress Italy, where we're going to mess around with the Panzers. This is the Corridor campaign from the Gustav Line module, centering on a German armoured counterattack at Salerno. I've wanted to do this campaign for ages, not only because I just don't play enough Fortress Italy and it looks amazing, but because I think it's going to make a good counterpoint to the slower paced American infantry focused Road to Montsberg campaign. At the beginning of September 1943, the strategic situation in the Mediterranean is not fantastic for the Germans. Although they managed to evacuate a good portion of their troops from the fighting in Sicily, they're not committed to defending southern Italy. Plans exist for a series of defensive lines across the peninsula to the south of Rome that take advantage of the mountainous terrain, but a more immediate problem than the Allies are the Italians themselves. Mussolini was dismissed and arrested back in July, and the replacement Italian government knows that it's losing the war, leading to German concern about their allies switching sides. This could potentially lead to disaster for German forces in Italy, especially if the Italians close the Alpine passes. So the level of German troops in the country quietly starts to build, and deployments alter so that they're in a position to seize vital infrastructure and subdue Italian forces if necessary. On the 3rd of September, there are two important events. The first is Operation Baytown, which sees Montgomery and the British 8th Army cross the Straits of Messina and invade the Italian mainland. The second is that the Allies and Italians sign a secret armistice. The Allies hope that the German forces in southern Italy will stand and fight, becoming pinned in place by pressure from 8th Army, but the Germans simply don't intend to get sucked in. They start pulling back to the north through the hilly terrain of Calabria, blowing bridges and destroying roads behind them as they go, making it difficult for the British to keep up. On the 8th of September, Allied Radio publicly announces the Italian surrender, prompting the Germans to spring into action. A combination of extensive planning, Italian uncertainty and a rapid decisive action pays off and the sudden but anticipated threat is neutralised. Disarming their Italian counterparts, German troops take control of vital road and rail links, airfields, ports, supplies and defensive positions. Complicating matters is the fact that the Germans know a major Allied naval force is at sea off Sicily it looks like a second invasion might be in the works. This hits 16 Panzer Division sector in the Gulf of Salerno, just south of Naples, early in the morning of the 9th of September, just after they've taken control of the coastal fortifications from the Italians. The Germans quickly resolve the Allied strategy. Obviously, the 8th Army in the south was intended to pin them in place, while the 5th Army landing behind them at Salerno cut them off, leaving them surrounded and easily destroyed. Unfortunately, the Allies face two major problems. The first is that the German forces in the south are not trying to defend Calabria as intended, they're already retreating north, so not only is the plan to trap them in southern Italy not going to work, but they're actually well placed to rapidly cauterize the beachhead. Secondly, the actual Salerno landings take place on an optimistically wide front. The two divisions of the British 10th Corps have landed at the north end of the Gulf, while the American 6th Corps has landed one division at the south end, keeping another as a floating reserve along with the 82nd Airborne who are on standby. Not only is the beachhead 35 miles long, but the Allied Corps are at either end and they're separated by the River Sele. Kampfgruppen from 16 Panzer Division react quickly, putting intense pressure on the Allied beachhead before it can gain the strength and depth it needs to properly protect its buildup. With German artillery falling on the beaches and the Luftwaffe attacking ships in the Gulf, well-screened German ground forces concentrate for a major counter-attack. This is finally unleashed on the 13th of September, which is when we're going to be playing as elements of 16 Panzer Division as they push for the beaches. The objective of the campaign is very simple. The Allies appear to have a weak spot in the corridor between the Sealy and Calore rivers, 
which we are going to exploit and punch through. Not only will this cut Highway 18 and split the Allied beachhead, allowing us to go on to defeat them in detail, but it will take us right up to the 5th Army Headquarters and General Clark, who has moved his HQ ashore to try and get a grip on the deteriorating situation. Before we go collecting General Stars though, we've got to punch through in the first mission. So, we've got the Colore River on our left, the Seely River on our right, and a great big chunk of open Italian farmland in between them. This is the titular corridor. The lead elements of our force are starting at the northern end, and opposite them we have our main objective, an exit objective on the southern map edge. Exit objectives are a bit funny in combat mission. I'm not going to get any victory points by exiting my force. Instead, the enemy gets points for units that I don't exit. It's not clear how many points the enemy has available here, the briefing simply labels exiting the map as a high priority, so although the numbers aren't shown, it's clear that that's the ultimate aim for the Germans here. In between me and that exit are four touch objectives, worth 125 points each. Knocking about enemy forces in order to reach these will clear them away from the road so that the rest of our force can follow up unmolested. This looks pretty straightforward until we take the timer into account. There are only 35 minutes on the clock. Luckily, the apparent mismatch between the enemy force and us is pretty significant. The briefing identifies the defenders ahead as being from the 143rd Infantry Regiment. This unit has been hammered since it came ashore, so it's low on morale, and it's been poorly deployed in the open corridor with only light anti-tank weapons, though it does have a lot of artillery on call. The 16th Panzer Division, on the other hand, was originally the 16th Infantry Division, which fought in the Battle of France, and despite being destroyed at Stalingrad in February 1943, a hard core of veterans from elements not caught in the Stalingrad pocket remained, and the division was reconstituted in France before heading to Italy. So much of the force in this mission is highly experienced. It's based around a Panzer Grenadier company mounted in half-tracks, two platoons, plus a heavy weapons platoon with four tripod mounted HMGs, two 81mm mortars and a pair of Stummels with 75mm guns. This is a fair amount of combat power, especially since every squad has two MG42s and the platoon leader's half-tracks also mount 37mm guns. But backing up our Panzer Grenadiers, we have two platoons of five tanks each. One of Panzer 4Hs with the long 75mm gun, and one of Panzer 3Ns with the short 75mm gun. The Panzer 3s here are almost exclusively armed with high explosive ammunition, so they're not really for anti-armour work, that's for the Panzer 4s, which have the muzzle velocity for that kind of thing. Finally, to round out the force, we have a forward observer and a battery of three 105mm WESP self-propelled guns on call. So, although it looks like we've got a tight time limit here, our entire force is very mobile and very hard hitting. This leads us neatly onto working out some kind of plan, and this doesn't take long. I need to smash through the American defence as fast as possible. My main concern is enemy anti-tank guns. If one of the half-tracks gets hit, then chances are no one is getting out, so they're top of my priority list. We do have some pre-battle intelligence for this mission, which has conveniently given us tentative contacts for three anti-tank guns that I'm going to mortar and artillery the crap out of on turn one. After that, I think the tricky part is going to be finding a balance between speed and caution in case the AT guns survive or there are other American AT assets out there. The Panzers start to move out as the pre-battle bombardment starts. The Wesps are hitting the most dangerous target, the possible AT gun up on the left hand hillside. This is perfectly set up to hit my forces in the flank as they advance across the farmland, so I've prioritised it. The 105mm shells scream in, and although they're less accurate than I might like, probably because I've been playing too much of the modern titles, it looks like they're getting the job done. The mortars are a different matter. These are both on a map, and firing at targets about 1600 metres away, they have some significant dispersion. One scores some near misses on the AT gun in the copse on the right, but the AT gun at the corner of the orchard on the left looks like it's probably gotten away scot-free. 
that's okay though. The mortars haven't used a lot of ammunition and they can always have another go when they get closer. Speaking of getting closer, I'm advancing the Panzer IV platoon on the left and the Panzer III platoon on the right, moving them up to the orchards on either side of the road. This is where this mission starts to nudge me out of my comfort zone. Rushing tanks into wooded terrain is not something I'm very happy doing. It could easily be full of little infantry teams clutching bazookas. What I'd usually want to do is send some infantry in first to check it out, but I don't have time for that, so I need to take a calculated risk. Are there likely to be enemy troops positioned this far forward? Probably not. The pre-battle intel suggests they're set up further down the corridor. And of course the panzers take up their positions with no problems, but it's just the beginning of this kind of thing. They spot some jeeps parked around a farmhouse at the third touch objective and engage, but the range is a bit far at 13 to 1500 meters so they don't score any hits. A little closer, however, they spot some American infantry in foxholes at the end of the nearest field. This corresponds to the pre-battle intel and it looks like it's going to be our first speed bump. My immediate plan to deal with them is to close in with the Panzer IVs from the front, while the Panzer III's exploit the cover of some woods on the right to gain a flanking position, though this depends heavily on resistance on the right and especially any American AT assets in depth that I don't know about. The Panzer Grenadiers, meanwhile, concertina up to the orchards, again with one platoon on either side. I've split the heavy weapons and stummels and assigned them to each platoon, so I basically have two little combined arms teams on each side of the road there's a tank platoon, a mounted infantry platoon, heavy machine guns, a mortar and a 75mm gun half-track. Once the infantry has moved up, the tanks start to move out from the orchards into the fields beyond. This attracts the attention of something in the far right orchard, which lands a hit on the lead Panzer IV. The incoming shell pancakes harmlessly on the lower front hull, which is very reassuring because a penetrating hit there would be likely to find ammunition stored beneath the turret. The offending enemy unit quickly resolves as an M8 Greyhound with a 37mm gun. This scout car isn't going to be much of a threat to the Panzers, especially at this range against the frontal armour, but a good hit on a half-track would be bad news, so leading with the tanks and using them to screen the infantry vehicles is already paying off. Coming up alongside the targeted Panzer IV, another one spots the Greyhound and engages. It takes a few shots to dial in the correct range, but the third scores a hit on the front and knocks it out. The tricky balance with all this is judging when to move the Panzer Grenadiers up. I'm pretty confident that the tanks can handle themselves. The enemy haven't shown a bigger calibre than 37mm yet, but the half tracks are a very different matter. If they move up too soon, they risk being caught by enemy AT weapons with disastrous consequences. If they hang around in one place for too long, they're likely to be smashed by enemy artillery. Speaking of which, only a minute after I move them out of the orchards, American spotting rounds start landing nearby. The advance continues. I'm leapfrogging tanks forward trying to gain ground without taking too many risks. Simultaneously aware of the ticking clock, we're already 10 minutes in, and that I'm going to need to preserve my force for future missions. On the right, the Panzer III's start to squeeze in around the bend in the River Seely, giving a US machine gun jeep a brown pants moment as they come around the corner, while the Panzer IVs spot and take out a second Greyhound tucked on the edge of the right side orchard by the road. Then the US infantry in front of the Panzer IVs makes a mistake. So far they've been deployed in foxholes behind the track just ahead, taking advantage of the cover of the track embankment. Now though, it looks like an entire platoon is leaving their shelters and moving forward into their battle position along the wall, presumably hoping to take advantage of the long field of fire. Due to the way the AI works, this is either because I've hit a trigger or because a certain amount of time has elapsed. Either way, the Americans are immediately lit up by the Panzers. The smart ones run away at the first sign of trouble. The braver ones are subjected to a hurricane of 75mm high explosive shells and machine gun fire. Interestingly, 
There are some signs here that this is a low quality formation as hinted at by the briefing. On close examination, the American riflemen are armed with bolt action M1903 Springfields instead of semi-automatic M1 Garands, which significantly reduces their firepower. They do have some bazookas, but my lead elements are still over 200 meters away and safely out of range. I'm actually more concerned about the left, where the AT gun in the orchard has opened fire and gotten itself spotted. Fortunately for my tanks, this is a 37mm gun, like on the Greyhound, and at this range and angle it's really relying on optimism to have any effect. The hail of fire from the Panzer IVs it quickly attracts, on the other hand, encourages the crew to take a more realistic outlook. They abandon their gun and leg it into the orchard. Again though, I need to make sure I don't lose momentum. Enemy artillery has started falling behind the Panzer Grenadiers, so they advance a bit further in their half tracks while the tanks edge closer. I really don't want to have to stop and put in an infantry assault, that's going to take up far too much time, so I press forward with the Panzer III's to flank the enemy's centre position. Covering that movement, one of the Panzer III's loses its commander to the MG Jeep we spotted around here earlier but it quickly gets its revenge and its compatriots are soon on the edge of the road firing into the flank of the centre position. This is far too much for the American front line who quickly start to flee but moving closer has brought my forces into range of the enemy's second line. This is about at the level of the Orchards and seems to be made up of the battalion's heavy weapons teams. M1917 HMGs open up, with one burst killing the opened up Panzer IV platoon commander. However, with the tanks practically on top of the first line, hosing down everything wearing olive drab, and no resistance outside of rifle and machine gun fire, I'm in a strong position. The FO has already called in a light max mission from the wests onto the left hand Orchard to deal with the AT gun there and he's able to quickly switch this onto the American second line to supplement the fire from the tanks. Again, the half tracks concertina forward to keep ahead of the enemy's artillery adjustments, and within a few minutes it looks like resistance has been effectively crushed. We're 20 minutes in at this stage though, so 15 turns left, and I really need to start thinking about those touch objectives. I'm definitely regretting not spreading out earlier. My right side force with the Panzer III's isn't in too bad a position to move on objectives 1 and 2, they're pretty much straight ahead of them, but my left side force with the Panzer IVs is clumped up quite close to the road and a long way from objectives 3 and 4. They're really going to have to divert to reach them, which is going to take time I might not have. It's worth a stab though. If it looks like it's going to take too long, I can always reorient them back onto the exit objective. So group left starts to peel off into the fields, while group right advances on the orchard ahead of them. Again, it's an exercise in screening the half tracks with the tanks. The infantry vehicles attract fire from American troops dug in under the trees who are quickly engaged by the armour. Objective 1's little cops is quickly touched by dismounted Panzer Grenadiers, but Objective 2 is much deeper inside the orchard and all those trees give me the willies. Meanwhile, I'm facing a similar problem on the left with Objective 4, which is also a fair way inside a wood. The time pressure is really pushing me to take risks I usually wouldn't, and with only 10 minutes left, the left hand stummel stops a little too far forward. One good bazooka shot later and it's out of action. It's probably just a lucky shot taking advantage of my carelessness, but I don't think I have time to dismount and properly clear out pockets of resistance, so I decide to bypass that objective. The far left elements of my force collapse back towards the centre to concentrate on objective 3 on their way to the exit. On the right, the same logic applies. Punching into the orchard to touch objective 2 seems far too risky, so the tanks and half tracks start to swing right around the trees to get at the objective. I can't resist the urge to at least try and get that one though. Resistance seems light or completely non-existent, and in the broader campaign context, 
it seems worth risking a single Panzer III to avoid potential trouble in follow-on missions, so one plunges into the orchard. It touches the objective without any problems, although it has a hair-raising pathfinding experience trying to get out again past the farmhouse full of enemy infantry. Luckily they don't seem to have any bazookas and preparatory fire from another Panzer III on the flank has left them far too terrified and suppressed to try and close assault the tank before it can escape. With their two objectives touched, Group Right sweeps past the orchard and disappears into the exit objective. The left is somewhat more worrying. Although there is a clear run for the exit, I still feel the need to send a Panzer Grenadier squad into the orchard to touch objective 3. Resistance is slight, and the enemy are obviously shattered at this stage, but like with the Stummel, all it takes is one lucky hit with a bazooka to ruin the day. The Panzer IVs keep their distance and are on hand just in case, but the infantry get away with it, touching the objective and then piling back into their vehicle for a quick escape. They're the last men out, literally exiting in the last few seconds of the game. The result is a German minor victory. I've scored 375 points to the Americans 245. That's a little closer than I would have liked, but I'll take it. The main rub is the fact that the four numbered objectives are touch for me, but occupy for the enemy. So the two I didn't manage to comprehensively clear out with firepower were still worth something to the enemy. That said, the casualties tell a very one-sided story. I've lost 3 dead and 5 wounded, 4 of those are the Stummel crew and the others are various tank commanders and half-track passengers who got domed putting their heads up in the line of duty. There's not much I could really have done about them, though the loss of the Stummel was perhaps unnecessary. The Americans on the other hand have had a bad day, with 98 dead and 42 wounded along with 2 greyhounds and 9 jeeps destroyed. It's worth remembering though that these were low quality inexperienced troops fighting on unfavourable terrain and from a mission design perspective certainly their purpose was to delay the player rather than stop him cold, which given the strict time limit they were surprisingly close to achieving. That timer certainly made me fight in a way that I'm not used to. This campaign looks like it's really not going to reward the kind of methodical geometric approach encouraged by the road to Monteberg. Instead, it looks like I'm going to have to be a lot more ballsy and take a lot more risks. So good job I've got loads of tanks then. Hope you all enjoyed this video. In the next one, we've got the Caesar River crossing. I'll see you there.